Hello, my name is Tiffany Flowers and I'm the campaign director of The Frontline. I'm a dark brown skinned black woman with um, red lipstick on and a hot pink sweater. I have long dark brown dreadlocks. Um, before we get started, I wanna let you all know that ASL interpretation is available on screen throughout the program and you can find access to Spanish simultaneous interpretation by calling the number at the bottom of your screen. So if you've joined us before, welcome back family. And if you haven't, I guess you're wondering who is the Frontline? The Frontline is a joint campaign between the Working Families Party, the Movement for Black Lives, United We Dream, and the Rising Majority. So why is the Frontline celebrating the legacy of Bell Hooks this month? Well, because Bell is a recent ancestor and we know and we feel and we see the relevance of her teaching every day. And so we wanted to take some time to pause, to share her work with our audience as it informs the work that we do and to also maybe pique your curiosity and introduce you to some new work by Bell that you've never caught before. So today we are joined by my friend, my sister, my dear leader, Ense Ufa, and I'm so happy to welcome her to the stage. Hello, Ense! Yes, How are you? I'm so happy to see you. I've been so excited. I, I love this month. I love all of our guests, but Ense and I actually have a real life relationship. Right, this is my real life friend. <laughs> and we work a lot, so we don't get to see and talk to each other a lot. That's so true. this is like a double, triple treat. So Welcome. One hundred percent. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. A and then thank you and the beautiful brilliance of the the village, the community that you and Leslie continue to construct for this wonderful, wonderful, amazing idea. Um, I can't wait to have this conversation with you. And I love you. Well, and say, you know, I'm a cry baby. <laughs> Thank you. And I love and admire you so much. So folks, just get ready for like a mutual love fest here and, and a wonderful conversation. And say, before we jump in, can you describe yourself to the audience? Yes, I can. Uh, I am Anse Ufad. I am a dark brown skinned woman uh, with a bold red lip today. Um, very big, clear glasses with shiny rhinestones um, and big curly hair with a black top with dramatic sleeves. Dramatic. Bring the drama. Bring the dra am I the drama? <laughs> Am I the villain? Not the villain, <laughs> but definitely the drama. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and say, so tell the folks who don't know what the New Georgia Project is and what an impactful and prolific leader you are, what you do. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so I run an organization called the New Georgia Project. Um, we are probably best known uh, for the large scale voter registration efforts that we run in all 159 of Georgia's counties, but we do so, so much more. Um, we are, uh, we build video games, we build mobile apps that are all designed to demystify power who has it, who doesn't, um, and how we can use it, how we wield it to build the Georgia and build the America of our dreams, to build the country that our families deserve and to stop bad things from happening. So we do voter mobilization and education, um, <clears throat> again, all designed uh, to win uh, for working people and to win for Black folks and people of color and queer people and uh, women and families. Man, this is why you guys are in for such a treat today. I'm telling yeah. you, NSA's work, the work of New Georgia Project and her leadership is just something you should get to know if you don't. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we out here. You, you out here. Um, I'm going to jump right in. Um, I don't know if you've caught any of the series, but I'm starting this like Sonali then in, in Brown Sugar. So instead of hip hop, we're asking, when did you get introduced to Bell Hooks? So I was introduced. Oh, people know, I went to um, undergraduate at Georgia Tech. Right. So math and science nerd, um, which is 
why people who really know me know that the the technology, leveraging technology, leveraging data and analysis to do justice work is like, it makes sense for me uh, and my path up to this point. But math and science magnet kid in high school went to an engineering uh, college uh, and a focus on sort of the scientific math, like science, right? Hard sciences. Um, but it's also in Atlanta, <laughs> right? Uh, and so, you know, while my, you know, academic career was very white, very male, very um, ones and zeros, um, I spent a lot of time over at the AUC, A, because I was fast, uh, but also B, because um, I felt like I was still getting nurtured intellectually and it rounded out, like I, I love my alma mater and I love Georgia Tech for what it gave me, but there is something to be said about the humanities. Uh, there is something to be said about a liberal arts education, right? And then there's value in that. And I knew that I was missing that um, at my engineering, in my engineering program. Um, and so, uh, you know, do you remember Shaza from uh, A Different World? Yes, God. <laughs> I met a boy. I met a boy who read books <laughs> and uh, was open and followed him. And again, through building relationships with academics, with professors, with young scholars at Spelman and Morehouse um, at Clark Atlanta University, when I wasn't taking my own classes, um, there was just, you know, debates about blackness and what that meant. And, you know, I'm an immigrant, um, was born in Nigeria, raised in Southwest Atlanta, became a U.S. citizen my senior year in high school when I realized that I wasn't eligible for all the grants and scholarships and loans because I was on a green card, right? <laughs> um, and so like I had a unique perspective in the HBCU environment. Again, um, I was also at a PWI, but found myself on an HBCU campus all the time. And so um, I think through the course of following this boy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> these marathon conversations with other young scholars about blackness, um, I was introduced to Bell Hooks. And here's the thing, like I also was introduced to Cornell West and other scholars at the same time, but the, the, the clarity with which she wrote and like the elegance in the simplicity of her analysis, like it would knock me over every single time I was introduced to a new text uh, by our ancestor. So I'd have to say probably my sophomore uh, or junior year, late teens, early 20s, uh, off on somebody else's campus. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Shaza to open to following him to Bell Hooks pipeline that we would we're gonna get into offline? <laughs> For sure, because <laughs> that's a real. <laughs> it's a thing. It, it happened. I'm sure it did. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Bell wrote that love is profoundly political. Our deepest revolution will come when we understand this truth. So how does this kind of kind of framing of love inform your own politics, friend? Um, it is literally the 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 the, the avocado seed, the mango seed, right? Mm -hmm. At the core of my organizing. Um, that I often am quoted and saying like, I can, I'm very good at telling people the things that I hate, the things that I hate, the people that I hate, the food, the candy, the shows that I hate. Right. But um, and it is itself a power source. Anger, frustration, disappointment are power sources. They will move people to action, um, but they always, always burn out. Right. Um, that it doesn't sustain you. It doesn't sustain our movements. And so when I think about uh, building a, a, a progressive political agenda for for working people, for black folks, for people of color in the South, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, King's arc of the moral universe. Right. That they it, it, they say that it is long, but that it bends towards justice. And when that quote is invoked, they're often talking about the work of bending the arc, right? What are you doing to bend the arc towards justice, right? I tend to focus on the fact that it is long, 
the heart of us, it is long, right? That, that many of us who are doing this work now won't be able, won't make it to the mountaintop, right? That the arc of the moral universe is, is CBS receipt long, right? And how do you sustain a movement? How do you sustain your political agenda? How do you sustain your campaigns? Uh, you need a renewable energy source. Come and on. that for me is love, right? Mm. The love that I have for myself, the love that I have for my family, and the love that I have for my people, my community, that when I ain't got it, when I'm tired, wow. when I'm tired of being gaslit, right? Like I go back into my bag of, you know, of love. Like I'm doing this to save my own life. I'm doing this because I want more for the people that I love. Oh, and, and it shows so much in your work. I'm so touched. I was leaning in like we were actually sitting here talking to each other. Because I know that it's true. Um, and I think often about that long arc and our commitment and the fact that, you know, many of us started this so young and you look back over that arc now, it's been 20 years. Right. Like 20 years. <laughs> uh, uh oh, yes. I mean, oh. I started when I was five. So. That's right. I mean, you was a, a little baby, baby. <laughs> right, 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 baby. Right. right. <laughs> and, and you're just like, I guess I'm I'm here, right? I'm here and I'm gonna be here, but right. there is also all these seeds that I'm planting that the chance that I'm gonna actually see it the way that I dream about it, right? Right. But it's so fulfilling to do the work and put in the love and know that one day we'll be beloved ancestors too. And it keeps me accountable, right? Um, because the truth of the matter is that, you know, I'm, listen, I'm from Scammerville, USA. Right? <laughs> Don't do the scammer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, for good or for ill, the scammers have made their way. All the countries, like best and brightest, most innovative scammers, find their way to <laughs> their city. I guess like the the rent in New York is too much, but um, I and in and, and unfortunately, it has also worked its way into sort of movement spaces, right? And so there are often people with brilliant ideas who stand up these C3s and these C4s and these packs and these campaigns, and they're talking about all the things that they're doing, and they're going out and they're getting big bags, right, for the work that they're doing. And I am not a hater at all, right? But the thing that keeps me accountable and like why I can always hold my head high um, and why I feel very good about the work that I do is that, again, I am anchored by the love that I have for myself and for my community. And so there, I make sure that there is no daylight between me and the New Georgia Project and the communities that we organize with. Right. And when people are hungry, right, when people are being beaten and bruised and disrespected and subject to state violence and precarious employment and all of that, you can't be out here, you know, uh, running fake campaigns and, and collecting big checks and not investing it in the fights that we're fighting right now, because those folks are in my face. Right. And so and because I love them, they can be in my face because I love them. Again, I make sure that there's no daylight between us and the communities that we organize with. So that also is how love informs our politics and our campaigns and keeps us accountable and keeps us going. Come on, News Wars or Project and say. Yeah. You brought so much love and joy into your work in the New Georgia Project, injected it into movement spaces and, and just really been so impactful in that way. So why is it built into your work? I feel like you've answered that a little bit, but I would like you to just like how you how that works with staff, how that works as an organization, how that love spills into the community like. Yeah. Um, well, one, we hire directly from the communities that we organize with. And so oftentimes <clears throat> the folks um, who are leading, you know, our vibe campaign, which is voting initiative and brothers engagement are folks who identify as black men. Um, and the sort of the, the, the joy, the frustration, the disappointment um, that Black men and as fathers, as lovers, as brothers, as, you know, in our communities, it works its way into our campaign. And so, 
You can't get up and go to work every day. Listen, we have registered over 600,000 people of color and young people in all 159 of Georgia's counties. This is like, like that. Let's, let's put a period right, right there. Right. And you right. don't do that, right? You don't do that without love and joy in your heart. That's a hell of a load. You guys work through Christmas, the holidays, the cold, COVID, COVID spikes, another COVID spike. I mean, let's just put a period behind that job. <laughs> right? <laughs> and here's the thing. We are also human. How many times do you ask somebody, are they registered to vote? And they tell you no and keep it pushing before you you know, get demoralized, right? You get demotivated. And so the, the you know, working with Frontline to do virtual comedy shows, right? <laughs> that are also secret voter registration drives, right? right? Working with Black and Latino developers to come up with video games, mobile video games that are in our phones, you know, uh, doing Twitch live streams with uh, esports players and professional video games are ways to also keep joy and love in our hearts and to keep us motivated and to keep us entertained. Because the truth of the matter is, is that if we're over it, like it's not going to inspire anyone. And people see that. People can tell when you're reading from a script, right? When you're calling them from the phone bank, right? Or when you're canvassing them, they know when it's, it's you embody a message, right? Um, and that you're coming because you are also impacted. You also care about the issue versus you're out here collecting a check and checking off a list, right? And so we try to keep joy centered to keep love centered again because it is a well that we can keep going back to it is a renewable energy source um and because it's fun and people want to be where it's fun it's lit over here pull up right and those are like really y'all's invitations and you know right. and say like your, your leadership style hey your joy is so palpable and 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 your leadership style is so um unique and brilliant in the sense of you know, the way that you truly lead from your heart. And I feel like so much in organizing and politics, people are discouraged from authenticity. And it's just like one way you're supposed to be and look and dress and we all know the rest, right? But the way that you move with such integrity and love in your work, I just have to say it out loud, friend. It's so inspirational and it's so um, needed in the world right now and so aligned with, you know, my own thoughts on care and relief. Everybody who knows me, that's all I'm pumping right now. I love it. But I'm love just it. so grateful for, you know, this, this true like love thesis and how it just, it, it touches all points of your life and your work. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And here's the thing. Yeah. I think that uh, I made a conscious decision. Um, again, I think probably after reading, uh, was it? No, Salvation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and just so that the, the audience knows that I come by this honestly, <laughs> I like, I, we like, listen, uh, coffee stains might, you know, might have some ashes and some of them. Like, this is real. <laughs> this is real. Not new. <laughs> right? But the idea that, um, you know, there was a black leadership sort of style, uh, I would say, uh, that uh, two or three generations before us uh, that insisted that, you know, because of our you know, the love for ourselves that we had overcome the hardships of slavery and ch like chattel slavery. And that we had overcome the hardships of Jim Crow in our country, right? And, <clears throat> and we were not honest about the pain. We were not honest about like how hard this is, how disappointed we are with the limitations of our political system, right? And so we had to get out there and be like, you got to get out here and vote because like that's the thing that's going to bring about the change, et cetera. And I endeavored to never lie to the people, never lie to myself. Mm and never lie to the people, right? That we, it was a, I, a commitment to a clear-eyed, sober analysis about the world as it is and the world as it should be. 
and the work that we're going to have to do to move from point A to point B. And the thing is, when you are up front with people like this, going to be hard, right? We're going to try to have fun, but this the 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 arc is long, y'all. Um, I think that people respect it. I think that people don't feel gaslit. Uh, people don't feel lied to, and they're rolling for as long as they can. I think the people respect it, but I think it's also like um, it's never easy to just tell ugly truths, right? Uncomfortable mm -hmm. truths. And and the more you organize and the more you practice the craft and mm -hmm. you realize like you're going to get through this really tough conversation. You're going to get through this really tough time with your leaders, your committee, your constituency, but you have to lead from the truth. Like you absolutely have to. It's the one thing that don't change, right? 100%. 100%. We have our own feelings, but you don't have your own facts. Right? Say one more time for the C10 dog. Listen, we can all have our own feelings, but we don't, we're not entitled to our own facts. That's not a thing. And so we need to start from a meeting of the minds, again, about the world as it is, the facts before us, the conditions before us, before we can organize, before we can move forward. And that's really, really important. And so I fight for that authenticity. Um, and and I'm also like humble enough to be like, you know, I was wrong, right? <laughs> like, you know, remember the thing I said that last time? I don't think that anymore, right? Yeah. Um, and I create that space for myself uh, in the hopes of, you know, modeling that behavior for other leaders and folks in our movement. You get new information, you shift. Um, and so, yeah, that that authenticity is really important to me. Um, and I seek it uh, in my friends, right, in lovers uh, and staff when we're hiring, um, in candidates, uh, all of that. I know that's right. So this, this next question goes right, sticking with the truth telling, um, going back to another thing dear ancestor Bell Hook said, the heart of justice is truth telling. Seeing ourselves in the world the way it is rather than the way we want it to be. We know this kind of truth telling gets vilified, especially when it comes from Black women, maybe sometimes even when it comes from younger Black women. So let's get into it. How do, <laughs> how do you and say... Leader Ufat. Why you get me in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Thoughtful questions, friend. Um, I mean, I will say this. I, I, we don't have our, we're not entitled to our own facts. Um, I think that um, there are times where even people who share our identities, right? Uh, you know, radical feminist black women organizers uh, can be, you know, wittingly or unwittingly tools of the oppressor. Um, and so when I fight to tell my truth, right? When I fight to tell the truth, I don't care who tell it. They, they, you know, in the South, they say, a lie don't care who tell it. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? 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 Yeah. Um, I, I want to show up in that way for, sorry, my apologies. Oh, uh, this is one of our elders. Um, they say, a lie don't care who tell it. And I, and I feel like I want to be uh, on the team that is defending the truth. Right, that is fighting for and creating space um, for the truth. The truth as I see it, the truth as I know it, um, and it has oftentimes meant, and that means, and that's everywhere. That's in groups and out of groups. That's with family, right, and with colleagues, with movement homies. Um, I remember. <laughs> Most recent voting rights fight. That um, elder wants your attention, by the way. They like and say, ignore me some more. <laughs> oh, no, my apologies. No, it's okay. Right. <laughs> you know you're busy, leader Ufa. <sighs> we know. That, We're so grateful village. for your time. It's it is. <laughs> no um, days off. The people don't know. No days off. No days off. Um, which is also why you gotta fight to maintain your boundaries, like to erect them and then 
pr preserve them uh, because people need what they need and they want what they want. Um, the and you have to protect yourself and, and your energy and your time and attention um, and your heart. Keep your heart three stacks. <clears throat> right. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I was just going to say that, oh, most recent voting rights fight, right? With the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Um, that, you know, we saw um, over 400 anti-voting bills being introduced in 49 out of 50 states. Uh, we, as a continuation of the January 6th attack on the Capitol, right, where they had uh, a failed murder plot to kill the vice president of the United States. They brought their own bags of poop to throw <laughs> on the walls of the Capitol. Um, and they had uh, their own electors, right? right? Because that they wanted to seat so that they could overturn the re results of the Electoral College. So like we understand there's a clarity that we know that they're not playing. They plan for keeps, right? That in the marketplace of ideas, fewer and fewer people are buying what they're selling. And in order for them to hold on to power, they're going to have to cheat. And they're going to, they, you want this American democracy, you want this constitution, you want these seats, you're going to have to get it back in blood, right? Like that is the energy that they are carrying with it. And so we knew that we needed a voting rights act and we need it now. We needed federal protections for the right to vote because we're headed into these critical midterms. <clears throat> And there wasn't a path uh, for it there. And we didn't have the sort of bold uh, champion that we thought we had in the in the president and the vice president. And they were coming to Georgia to make a voting rights speech. And so I said, with my comrades, with our colleagues, don't come here if you just have rhetoric. If it's just another speech, like we could be using your time, your talent, your energy in all of these other different ways. That's not don't come here, right? Like we're grateful for a president that understands that voting is important in this moment. But if you just are coming for a speech, we good, right? And that was the message. When I tell you, baby. Three star. Yeah. Three star. Uh, the, uh, the, the church mothers. Uh, and the Democratic Party loyalists came for me, came for us. We didn't understand how politics work. We didn't understand the separation of powers. We didn't understand federalism, right? That we need, we were immature and unreasonable, right? Now, it was all thank Black women, all 2020 and 2021. <laughs> and that's why I was in my bag about it, right. because you wanted to carry and say to the Kang, on the throne. <laughs> huh. You, you, huh. And when she kept that same energy, right? Because that is the, the, the integrity, right? The love that I have for Black people, the clarity that we have about power, right? Who has it? Who doesn't? How much we need in order to win? That's what got us to this moment, right? That's what got us. Because here's the thing. January 6th was the show. The dress rehearsal was happening in Georgia and in, in, in Atlanta and Baltimore and state legislatures all over the country. They showed up with big guns. Right. Like trying to intimidate, trying to stop the, the electoral college uh, vote, trying to stop the counting of the votes like they, they they were not playing. And so that is what got us to this place. That is that energy is what us holding the line is what prevented them from stealing it. And when we continue to hold the line, even with our friends, right, that that was somehow a, a, a bridge too far. Right. That, that I somehow don't know what I'm talking about now. Um, and so we had to have some uncomfortable conversations and, and communicate some difficult and painful truths to our friends. Right. But again, because if I because I love you, I'm not going to lie to you. Right. Um, not in this moment, not with all that we have at stake. Um, and so that also is a lesson that I got uh, from Bell Hooks. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, and also Emil Car Cabral uh, and my mama. <laughs> hey, mama. Upa. Hey, mama. Upa. <laughs> Shout out to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And love and lies can't exist in the same place. I can't. If I love you, I can't lie to you. And I just on that moment. Friend, I just want to say, 
I was so proud of you. I was so proud of the New Georgia Project. I was so proud of Black Voters Matter and all the folks that actually stood up and held the line. Because you know what? You also touched on earlier how exhausting, how painful, how long we hold this, this these troops inside and try to do all the right things the right way. And, and it, it didn't have to come to that. Like you said, if we felt that our message was impactful enough for you to take it serious enough to really work hard for this. Right, 100%. Um, and <laughs> have you ever like been running towards the elevator and you know it's about to close and you get the impression that like somebody, there's somebody in there and it looks like they're trying to press the door open button, but really they're just pressing the metal plate <laughs> and they're going to let the door close on you. Like they're doing the things that look like they're doing to help you. Like they look like they want you to make it like, come on, come on. I'm holding the door, but really they're just pressing the metal plate. That's right. That is, and when I said that, <laughs> right, people were offended. But there's a difference between doing the things that look like you're fighting the good fight, that look like you're with us, right, and like actually having some skin in the game, actually making the sacrifices. And there is sacrifice that comes with this, right? You know, again, time, attention, um, all of that. Like, I, you don't think I want to go and work on my TikTok choreography? <laughs> yeah, I'm about to come down there just to practice with it. Yeah. <laughs> like, but this, I don't want to lie to the people. I love us too much. I love myself too much. I want rest, right? I want to retire, <laughs> right? I want the promises of the American dream. I want them to be real for me and people who look like me and people who I love. Right. And so I'm willing to fight for it um, and be honest about what that fight looks like at all times. And you are and you all have been and, and you're, you're showing the love and doing the work. And I don't really think there's more that you could ask for, you know, really. Um, and so my final question, our conversation has just flowed. It's almost like we knew this would work. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 My final question for you, friend, is do you think love is missing in current political conversations? And what is love's place in our political and social movements? Mm. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's not missing from the conversations that we're a part of, right? Um, but if we start thinking about dominant narratives, right, and, uh, you know, the, the meta conversation that like lots of people are having, um, you know, on social media and mainstream press, et cetera, um, <laughs> on the floor of Congress, right, uh, an argument can be made that love is missing and that uh, it is cold and lifeless and brutal um, and defeatist and transactional. And that is why our politics look the way they look, uh, because love is missing um, from uh, the, again, the meta, the dominant political narrative, the dominant political conversation, um, the dominant agenda setting. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I do think that there's a fight for it. Here's what I will say about the uh, Biden administration. When I think about, um, you know, Build Back Better, um, when I think about like the the expansion of the definition of infrastructure to include human infrastructure, to include human capital, when I start thinking about like the service economy and um, healthcare providers and, and people who provide care, uh, the idea that we're talking about this in terms of the caring economy, right? Like that comes from a place of love, right? It is public policy. It is love as public policy, right? The way that we live in multi-generational households because people are living longer, right? And so, you know, there's there's mom and then there's grandma and then there's grandkids and everyone is all in the house together, right? And so thinking about how we construct an economy that recognizes that that is a legitimate family, right? And that we need to support that as legitimate family structures and then making sure that there are laws Right, that there are uh, policies, that there are resources uh, that invest in protecting and supporting and standing up that kind of family as well. That's love as policy. Um, and so, you know, shout out uh, to Joseph Robinette Biden uh, and 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 the team and co. Right, because that again, they it is it has not 
it has yet to be realized because we don't have the power uh, to to pass these bills yet because uh, there are definitely foxes in the Democratic hand house. Mm-hmm. Talking about you, Kirsten. Talking about you, Joe. We're looking <laughs> right, at you. right. Literally uh, you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, we the people of West Virginia, I see y'all. I see the fight. Like we 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 are with you. Um so yeah, like I it is missing from the dominant conversation, but it's not completely absent. There are many of us that are fighting um, and being subversive, right? There's an inside and outside strategy. Uh, I am definitely not in anybody's inside. I definitely don't get invited to the group chats, <laughs> right? But I know my lane, I know my role. Um, <laughs> And so I think that that is how it informs our work. It it keeps us going. It keeps us accountable, right? When I think about the outside game um, and the folks who are on the inside, who are part of these institutions that are responsible for bringing public policy and bringing uh, all of that to life. uh, I think that there are some who have made it on the inside who are bringing that love and it informs their work and their advocacy. That's right. Well, and Slay Leader Ufat. This has been so delightful. I really do appreciate your time. I know that you're busy. You got dogs, you got elders, you got staff, you got Mama Ufat. Now, I don't even know what the rest of your day or evening will entail, but I know that we feel deeply blessed to have gotten an hour of your time. Uh, I love you. I love this conversation. Um, and I, I'm very, I'm still very optimistic and excited about what we are building um, and what we're going to win on the other side of this. So thank you for having this. Having me. And on that note, tell the people how to support, where to find you, the org on these internet streets, you know, what y'all out here doing right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, New Georgia Project on all of the social media um, channels. Uh, Our website is newgeorgiaproject.org. As always, your time, your talent, or your treasure uh, (laughs) is welcome. Uh, Again, as we think about how to fight for and construct the world that our families deserve. um, We are always, I believe that everybody should have a movement home. Everybody should have a political home. Um, It doesn't have to be the New Georgia Project. We'd love to have you, but there are people who share your values, who care about the things that you care about. So join a organization. Um, but yes, we're a New Georgia Project on all the things. I'm Nse Ufat, N-S-E-U-F-O-T, on all of the things except for Instagram. Uh, on Instagram, I'm Nse Ufat 404. Um, shout out to the 404. Shout out to the 404. <laughs> Not the error code. It's Atlanta's <laughs> area code. <laughs> For the people. Right. And then we'll be at South by Southwest. We are debuting our first video game. Oh, my um, goodness. Yes, Shimmy. Yeah. So super excited about that. Uh, it's called This Is Not a Game. Um, and, yeah, we're building. We're working. We're trying to innovate because uh, uh, we love ourselves. And we How love exciting. Them. We love you. I love you. Frontline loves NGP. It's all love and it's all family. And say thank you so, so much. I really can't thank you enough. Thank you. You're welcome. A genuine feminist politics always brings us from bondage to freedom, from lovelessness to loving. There can be no love without justice. Hello, my name is Tiffany Flowers and I'm the campaign director of The Frontline. I have on a hot pink sweater. I'm a dark dark brown skinned black woman. My hair is up in a bun. I have on bold, colorful um, eyeglass frames and my pronouns are she and her. Right now, I am completely honored and just feel so lucky and blessed to be bringing to our audience the one, the only U.S. representative for the state of Massachusetts, representing the seventh congressional district, our leader, our sister, Representative Ayanna Presley. Welcome to the stage. Welcome to the front line. Thank you so hey. much. Thank you Hello. so much. How are you? It's so good to, to be here with the front line. And, hey. um, you know, very much appreciate uh, 
you're being uh, intentional about being inclusive. So I want to follow suit. So uh, I am a, um, a light brown complexion, bald woman uh, wearing a, a soft red lip, hoops, and a black turtleneck. Come through soft red lip. It's yes. a soft red lip. Yeah. <laughs> Representative Presley, again, I just I can't thank you enough on behalf of the front line for being with us today to share some of your time and your knowledge. And also, I bring birthday greetings on behalf of the front line. We heard you had a birthday recently. Okay, listen, it's, it's Aquarius season. You know, I have to represent with that big Aquarius energy, you know, right. every day, you know. And, and Tiffany, our little birdie told me that uh, you were on the precipice of celebrating your own born day, my fellow Aquarius. So happy early birthday to you. Thank you. The kids, I believe, call this my Obama year. Y'all do the math. <laughs> Thank well, you I have so not much. heard that, so I must be a real auntie because I'm 40, <laughs> so I don't know what year that is. I just know that I'm holding. You see these cheek bones? Baby, <laughs> it's still 44 because he was 44. Yes. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's yes. right. Okay. All right. Okay. See? All right. Help Learn each other. Way. Exactly. Always helping each other out. That's what Black women do. Okay. Um, I want to jump right into it. So the frontline question of the month that we've asked every single person that we've talked to is, when were you first introduced to Bell Hook? Yeah, first of all, I just love that you're doing this. And, um, you know, you just never really fully understand how much someone has shaped um, how you show up in the world, um, your identity, your your pride, your consciousness, um, you know, often until they transition and become an ancestor. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but I was uh, so sad. You know, I just felt just... Uh, enveloped in sadness. And um, so far as when Bell Hooks was first introduced to me, it was actually at a book sale at my school, I think, um, like a used book sale. And um, I think I might have been in the seventh grade. And it was her, um, her book, Ain't I a Woman? Mm. Yeah, so that was that was the first time. I was always a voracious reader, reader, I'm an only child. And um, you know, uh, books were my were my friend. Uh, you know, early early on in life, and my father um, is a writer, um, and and uh, you know, my mother was a creative writer, um, and so you know, I was exposed to to many uh, literary heroes uh, who stoked and shaped my black consciousness. Uh, Bell Hooks, chief amongst them, but but I think my relationship uh, with Bell Hooks is uh, more intimate and personal because. Um, I discovered her on my own. Mm -hmm. That's you know? right. Yes. Yeah. It's been so one of the, first of all, thank you for acknowledging the work that we're trying to do around what Belle taught us and her legacy, because we really wanted to engage our audience in some love work this month and just not that capitalist commercial pink heart love, right? But like the love work that will, that will carry us, the love work, the legacy of love that she left for us. And so we want our audience to be curious and interested and maybe go visit old texts or find out about new texts. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, we absolutely. That. Um, so I want to talk about you. You are famously quoted as saying, policy is my love language. I would really love to hear you talk about how you arrived at that concept, what it's meant to see others pick up on that call to action, and just like how you got so crisp and clear about that, like that one line. OK, well, let me start at the beginning. So. Um, Prior to my election to Congress, I served on the Boston City Council for eight years. And um, I was the first uh, woman of color, first black woman elected to that body. That, that only took 100 years. Um, and now representing the Massachusetts Seventh, I'm the first person of color, period, and first black woman to represent the Commonwealth and the House of Representatives. And, and that took 230 years, right? Um, and there's a professor in Boston who says that when when black women are elected, when we break ceilings, they're not glass, they're concrete. And uh, before I broke that first concrete uh, ceiling, 
Uh, and I don't do anything alone. Before myself, the movement and the ancestors broke that first concrete ceiling in 2009 or eight when I was elected to the Boston City Council. You know, people said, why are you running? And I, you know, I said, I'm, I'm running because I want to save our girls, girls that don't even know they need saving. Mm. And I felt that the, the public discourse narrative was so dominated by how at and proven risk black and brown boys are. And girls were growing up in the same conditions. And I remember having some pretty um, impassioned debates within our home community amongst black folks saying, well, it's, it's the boys that are dying. And I would say, and, and they're being raised by, you know, uh, by mamas, you know, one in four who uh, have experienced um, uh, trauma or sexual violence um, that, has, that has never been healed. And so, you know, these, these cycles repeat. And um, I felt girls deserve, black girls, gender specific, that they deserved gender specific and responsive programming and policies. And so when people would say to me, but it's the black boys that are dying on the street. And I would say, and it's the girls that are slowly dying right in front of you that no one is seeing mm. what he's talking about. And so, you know, we're not going to have an, an um, oppression Olympics here. You know, the point is that our destinies are tied. That's right. And so um, my brother's keeper and my sister's keeper. Um, and so I ran, you know, on an agenda, um, my heart's work um, to, to do the work of saving girls and taking it back to bell hooks. Um, you know, this, this quote is the one that I sort of revisit the most and that, you know, I would talk to girls about, and it's just, you know, she says, um, and this was in a uh, 2000 uh, when she says feminism, that's from uh, feminism is for everybody. Okay. And bell bell hook says, if any female feels she needs anything beyond herself, Mm. to minimize and validate her existence. She is already giving away, giving away her um, space to be self-defining, you know, her, her agency, right? And so that's true. But I also realized that there were real embedded systemic barriers to the safety development, the health and wellness, the joy and the thriving of black girls. And so, the point here is, if we can legislate hurt and harm, mm. if we can uh, codify um, discrimination and, and draconian or short-sighted budgets and policies, if we can legislate hurt and harm, then we can legislate equity, we can legislate healing, we can legislate justice. So I say policy is my love language because uh, policy is how we have created inequity, disparity, and, and racial injustice. And all of that has been disproportionately bore by black women. And so, you know, we cape for our democracy, we cape for our communities, uh, you know, we, we cape, uh, you know, in our faith, in our faith houses, you know, and we've come to celebrate uh, a resiliency that is born out of a, a systemic hardship that, that we can do something about, uh, that we can and must disrupt to undo centuries of trauma and hurt and harm uh, exacted onto black women. Um, and so that's why I say policy is my love language. So that was a, a long origin story, but you know, just uh, trying to, to get to the root of it. No, thank you for that. And thank you for your, your unapologetic representation and naming hurt, harm in a path to healing, right? For our communities, because I think, um, so often elected officials are fearful of being authentic and naming the thing and, and just calling out what people really do want to and need to hear in terms of how we can make this world a better place. So thank you. Thank you for that. It's just really inspirational to hear. And on that note, you know, you are and have been always such an accessible um, elected official. And so many of us see ourselves in you and the work that you're doing. Um, and I'm reminded of the quote from Bell Hooks, the choice to love is the choice to connect, to find ourselves in the other. So how has that connection with others served your political work? I mean, I'm sorry, do you have a spiritual experience every time uh, you hear the words of Bell Hooks? Because I do. It stirs something so deep in me. It is, it, it is, it is like new, but like, familiar in a like deeply ancestral spiritual kind of way, you know, every time I hear her words and, you know, I've, I've fumbled over the delivery of that quote because it's hard to do the words justice when you're reciting them. But um, 
you know, in terms of connectedness, you know, I, I've always believed and certainly, uh, you know, Bell Hooks underscores this, you know, that we're all connected, right? Um, our, our destinies are, are, are truly tied. And, you know, I love that uh, when she spoke about marginalization, that she said it was not just about deprivation. You know, it was also about radical possibility, right? And so, you know, I seek uh, to govern in a way uh, something that I characterize as cooperative governing, you know, uh, to do this work in symbiotic partnership with community so that we can actualize radical possibility, so that we can, through lawmaking, manifest radical love, because love is a verb. It is a demonstrated action. And, you know, I also say very often, but more importantly, I seek to practice this, not just to say it, that the people closest to the pain should be the closest to the power, driving and informing the policy making. Uh, and so I'm intentional uh, about that. I don't uh, cast a vote, write a bill, co-sponsor a bill without engaging those most impacted. It's so important to be in proximity to better understand the nuance, the intersectionality, the complexity of issues, but it's also by being in proximity to those most impacted where we develop the best solutions so that uh, we can uh, actually uh, live, uh, you know, love out loud in our movement building and, and in our policies. Man, I dream a world where your leadership model could be adapted <laughs> in a way that people could really move through the work with that lens. Because I really, I mean, you're not my elected official, but I feel like you speak for me every single time you open your mouth and, and your work and your, your closeness to the community shows through. Um, so I know we don't have much left time left for you, but I want to get into another quote. So Bell wrote, profound changes in the way we think and act must take place if we are to create a loving culture. And so how do you maintain a loving culture around you? As we know, you're in a lion's den dealing with so much hate in politics in Washington, D.C., in the general environment right now. How do you manage yeah, I think it's in the words of, of that that quote, which I said earlier, you know, about um, agency and not needing external variables to validate my existence, because my very existence is the resistance. You know how I, um, uh, you know, dress these curves, how I navigate uh, spaces as someone living with alopecia, as a black bald woman. Um, you know, it. it I think I, you know, through the poets that I read from Nikki Giovanni uh, to Sonia Sanchez to uh, thought leaders uh, like Bell Hooks who we're honoring here today, uh, you know, they, they center me, uh, they, they ground me. And of course my faith and, and my family, um, I hope that what I'm doing really is honoring the tradition and the role that black women have played throughout society and every transformative social movement. And that is that when we are at the table, we shake it and we are truth tellers and we are uh, justice seekers and we are magic and we are majestic. And uh, in that there have been so many attempts to kill us a little bit at a time, you know, culturally and through lawmaking, we are miracles. Amen. Period. Period. And I also hope, just want to add that you feel the, the the love and the wind of the movement behind your back. I hope that you know that we're always waiting and looking for a direction from you in ways that we can all work together. So I hope that we're a part of that support system. I take my cues from you. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking to each other and leaning on each other, you That's know, great. so uh, in the, in the, state of, the state of the movement is strong, you know. Amen. So, yes, we are. Being here today. Of course, I got one last question for you. And this is just on the theme of love that we started on. Okay. Do you think that love is missing in current political conversation? And what is love's place in our, in our movements? Yes, there's absolutely an absence of love. Um, 
you know, as I've said many times before, I don't think that there is a deficit of resource. You know, we we struggle or we fail to meet the basic needs of people. Um, not for a lack of resource, but for a deficit and a lack of empathy. Mm. Um, and I think that when you, you know, try to center something like love, um, which my sister in service, uh, Representative Bush, does well all the time and saying, well, if I love you, I want you to have health care. If I love you, I want you to feel safe in community. If I love you, I want you to, you know, experience joy, to thrive, you know. Um, and so I think when uh, you try to bring up love in a policymaking space or around decision making tables, people see it as this sort of intangible, maybe, you know, hokey thing. Um, but, you know, love is um, is dynamic. It, it should be tangible and impactful. And it's a verb. Uh, it, it's something that has to be uh, practiced and demonstrated. And so um, there is definitely a, a deficit of empathy, not resource uh, and, and a deficit of love. And we have to be more intentional about centering it and and leading with love and modeling love and all the things that people like radical love radical love people radical love. Love and us we're all trying to do right now in this moment of deficit of empathy and compassion and also try not to let it take us down too right just love everywhere <laughs> representative ayana presley let me just say you have been nothing but a joy, and we are so honored that you were here. Before you go, I'm sure that our audience, there's somebody in our audience that wants to know more about you, where to find you, where can the people find you on the internet streets? Yes, busy in the Zoom and internet streets these days. <laughs> um, so uh, you can um, uh, follow uh, my work, and, and hopefully we can enlist you, uh, you know, in this movement of radical possibility and radical love and cooperative governing. Um, you can uh, find me um, on Twitter at R-E-P-P-R-E-S-S-L-E-Y -S -S at Rep Presley. And that is the same across all platforms. And, um, you know, please do uh, lean in so that we can, can, can do the work of replacing systems and policies of hurt and harm and uh, replace them um, with the work of, of healing and hope and, uh, replace, uh, you know, instead of oppression with liberation. Um, so we need you. You know, this is a period of, as Reverend Barber says, of, uh, of reconstruction. That's and right. we're enlisting all of you as, as movement and community builders uh, in that reconstruction. So you can find me at R-E-P-P-R-E-S-S-L-E-Y, -S -S -E Rep Presley, on all platforms. You heard Representative Presley. We need you on the front line. She needs you. The front line needs you. There's a place for everyone in this fight. Representative Ayanna Presley, representing Massachusetts 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You got it. And happy birthday, sis. And happy birthday to Aquarius Nation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Take All care. Right. Thank you. Frontline audience, what a treat that was. So please join us next Wednesday, March 2nd at 7 p.m. Eastern time as we bridge Black History Month into Women's History Month with an intimate conversation with the one and only Dr. Bernice King, CEO of the King Center for Nonviolent Social Change to talk about the role of love in movement and their Be Love campaign. As always, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again on the front line. Take care, friends.